Welcome to IS Squared seminar web series. After watching this video, let us know if it helped you or if you have any other questions or comments. And be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new videos just like this. Thanks so much for watching. Hi, my name is Tom Harpam. I'm a principal architect here at IS Squared. And today I want to talk to you about SD-WAN or Software Defined Wide Area Network. A few of the topics I want to cover today, a little bit about myself, uh, what Gartner sees as uh, SD-WAN, a little history, you know, what brought us here. We'll get into what is SD-WAN, some of the components. You might be surprised there's uh, several of them been around for quite a time, quite a while. Talk a little about the use cases and then uh, a general demonstration. So I've been in the industry since about 1989, started out with uh, modems and stat luxes and a lot of green screens, seeing the evolution to uh, Ethernet and uh, Internet in the early 90s. Um, that was uh, quite a transformation. I did a lot with uh, voice, voice over analog versus uh, today's voice over digital. So I just went through the transformation there. And I've worked with a lot of different uh, vendors uh, over the years, uh, both on security, routing and switching side. I specialize in both networking and routing today. Uh, and I've been security focused over the last uh, 15 plus years with a little over 30 years experience. So Gartner's perspective on SD-WAN is WAN, excuse me, WAN edge infrastructure. Basically, they're talking about the WAN, what's happening with the WAN today, the demands that are being put on it. Uh, there's so many more applications that are on the internet that are very useful for a lot of companies. Uh, there's a lot of cloud computing taking place, moving applications out of the uh, data center, private data center, moving them to data centers, both uh, for ER, for backup, uh, for cloud computing, uh, private uh, data centers, uh, so we're really moving that stuff around. And Gardner's uh, perspective again on it is just the dynamic and expanding business demands of the WAN edge. Some of the top players in the Magic Quadrant, um, take it as a grain of salt, Fortinet, Silver, Silver Peak, and VMware, uh, the leaders from uh, Gardner's perspective. So some of the history, how we got here, well, it really is the need for bandwidth. With uh, more and more web, app web applications being developed for the business, uh, companies are using more and more uh, internet to get to those applications that are being moved to the cloud, uh, both uh, internal applications and leveraging the commercial applications. Uh, data centers moving off, off the uh, premises and moving out to the cloud or in the private, uh, private uh, infrastructure as a service. Um, BYOD, so you've got a lot more devices on your network. You've got IoT, Internet of Things, so you just have a lot more data uh, being, you know, leveraging your, your WAN, more devices, um, and just that need for bandwidth. Cost of service, so there's been, you know, uh, traditionally uh, in the market, we saw a lot of point-to-point -point private links, uh, very reliable, very uh, symmetrical, um, not shared with anybody else. We went to MPLS. Uh, we got some of the similar reliability, but we got to see some of the cost structure change. Uh, and then as we've added more and more internet and more business over internet, uh, we've gone to business class internet connections. However, they come with a cost, so there's a lot of commodity internet connections out there. Uh, while not as reliable, uh, you can save some costs there, and we see companies using those for for their WAN as well. Uh, re reliability is a big factor. Obviously, we need to make sure the links are reliable. We need to reduce downtime, we, uh, minimize uh, packet loss. We need to minimize jitter for real-time applications. So these are all factors that we need to consider. Availability, obviously availability is one of our key points here, uh, making sure that the internet or WAN in that case is available. Uh, it's always up and reliable um, for the links that we have on it. So what is SD-WAN? So Software Defined Wide Area Network. It's made up of a series of components that really been bubbled up into a nice, a uh, lot more easier to configure today than it used to be. So some of the components is multiple links. Obviously you need more than one link to take care of, take advantage of SD-WAN. Uh, multiple links starts with uh, uh, leveraging equal cost multi-pathing, so that's been around for a lot of years. It's been used uh, both static routing and BGP and other routing protocols. Uh, additional component, policy-based routing. So policy-based routing is just that. You're defining a policy and then you're telling it what route or what path to take. 
So it can be on source, destination, or both, and a service as well. Service level agreement. So we want to make sure and check our links and validate that they are actually working they, and they have minimal delay and packet loss uh, and jitter on them. And we have uh, several, um, um, several command line entries that have been around for a lot of years to be able to test those and uh, provide some of that feedback to be able to make decisions on. Quality of service. Now, while it's not directly uh, associated with SD-WAN, it's certainly a factor that uh, that I uh, that I strongly consider. Obviously, when we're putting traffic on these links, we want to make sure that we're providing the uh, quality of service appropriate for that traffic. Whether it's voice needs to be uh, real time, prioritized, uh, business level traffic, or non business traffic that needs to be uh, you know uh, put behind or queued. Um, and allow business traffic to get around it. Traffic steering. Well, traffic steering is uh, just a component of policy based routing. With today's uh, products, most of them, a lot of them are application aware. So we can now steer traffic based on the applications. That's really what we're talking about there. So a little bit more about each component. So equal cost multipathing. So leveraging multiple links. In this case, we have two ISP links. We have a route table uh, that has two routes in it with both the equal costs. So cost is determined by a couple of things. It's whether it's static route uh, or a dynamic route. If it's a dynamic route, there's a lot of different administrative distance that's already calculated into that. Uh, there's many other factors that go into the routing, routing costs as well. Uh, we won't get into that in this seminar, uh, but certainly it's just something to be aware of. So when you have two routes with the same cost, then essentially, your route engine is going to send traffic across both links with whatever uh, load balancing algorithm you have in that device. So what happens when a link becomes congested or degraded? Well, if you're using either static or dynamic, if you're using static routes to do your eco-cost multipathing, not ideal, but I've seen it done in labs and other things. Um, obviously, if that link carrier is up, we're going to continue to send traffic on that link. If you're using a dynamic routing protocol, which is a lot more common than we've seen in the past, then the dynamic routing protocol is going to rely upon the two endpoints to negotiate the protocol and send those routes uh, back and forth across that link. Now, a link can become congested enough and the dynamic routing protocol still be active on that link and maybe missing a, a hello here and there as far as packets getting back and forth, but the route may still be in the routing table and we still may be sending traffic on that link if it's not degraded enough to take the routing protocol down. So obviously both cases, that's still a problem. So policy-based routing, again, if we have a routing table that has two routes in it, in this case, we have one with an administrative distance or day AD of 10, and we have one with an AD of 50, uh, the traffic is going to take the default route with the best cost as described in the last uh, slide and it's going to send that traffic uh, over ISP1. When we create a policy route, what we're really doing is we're saying, hey, I have traffic coming from a certain source. It's going to a destination. Maybe it's a series of ports or services, uh, TCP or UDP ports, and we want to uh, send it out ISP2. So that takes precedence over the routing table when a policy is set up. So that traffic gets routed out over ISP2. I've seen a lot of companies do this for purely just, I've got two ISP links and I want to send some traffic out ISP2, rather than that link just sit idle and just be waiting for a failover event. So for service level agreements, again, we need information to be able to, do, to uh, decide what link or links to leverage um, and ensure that we are calculating uh, the delay, the packet loss, and the jitter, because every application is going to um, have certain requirements and potentially, with the, in the case of voice, if there's too much jitter or too much packet loss, and even too much delay for that matter, any one of those can impact voice uh, uh, along that path. So we run a series of tests ping, uh, HTTP GET, TCP ECHO, uh, certain protocols that we can run outward across our link and we can calculate and we can continue to do this and continue to calculate 
our delay, packet loss, and jitter for our first ISP, and we do the same for our second ISP as well. And we run those same calculations, and between the two we can see now which one at this particular moment and test time is the better link. Obviously, the ISP link one would be a lot better for voice. It's got less delay, no packet loss, and almost uh, a very low jitter. So if you put voice on ISP2, jitters at 90 milliseconds, you're likely to start seeing some problems there. So we want to keep that in mind. So again, different protocols to be able to test. Again, we're testing to Office 365. Um, these different attributes, I'm sure Office 365 would work just fine. But again, there's other applications out there that any one of these attributes could have an impact on if too high. So quality of service, I found this uh, picture on the internet. I thought it was uh, appropriate as we're all feeling the stay at home, stay safe, um, you know, with businesses either closed or reduced amount of service. So with guidelines, obviously some uh, companies are staying open or businesses are staying open, but there's a lot of queuing going on where we're staying six feet apart and we're waiting in line because uh, they can only allow so many people on each doors. I certainly felt that over the weekend. I was at Home Depot and waiting outside. Luckily, the weather was nice, and so I just enjoyed my time and uh, waited my turn. We see this also with uh, uh, traffic on our busy freeways. Obviously, a nice clean path at 2 a.m. in the morning would be a nice clean 20 minute drive. The same uh, same path at two o'clock in the afternoon could be anywhere from an hour to six hours, depending on where you are in in traffic and how dense that traffic is. Ways of uh, you know traffic has been handled is with HOV lanes, carpool lanes, trying to allow uh, certain cars you know to travel in those HOV lanes to uh, help that traffic along. While it hasn't been uh, a perfect solution, it certainly is helping. At the end of the day, we only have so much bandwidth. Obviously, every piece of traffic that the uh, packets pass through adds a little bit of uh, delay because it's got to process through buffers. Uh, congestion can cause uh, not only delay, but result in jitter and packet loss. We've talked a little bit about that. So applying QoS allows the network team to ensure critical data is queued first to minimize its delay. So traffic steering, as we talked before, it's really nothing more than policy-based routing. <clears throat> but the reality is, is that with today's uh, products, they're application aware. So we are able to steer traffic based on business needs. So in the case here where we have a normal routing table, again, we have two administrative distances, so our default route's gonna be uh, ISP1 in this case. But we wanna create a rule, in this case, we're creating an SD-WAN rule it's no more than a policy route at the end of the day, but we're saying non-business traffic, we want to send out ISP2 and business traffic to, for instance, Office 365 uh, forward out ISP1. So we have traffic going out both links uh, based on rules and eventually um, as an ISP1 or ISP link uh, goes down, uh, this traffic can then traverse over to their link and continue to forward. So the takeaway here is today's products are application aware, uh, so they can take advantage of the various applications out on the internet, meaning giving them the capability of steering these applications onto the particular internet uh, or link that you want to put them on uh, and or based on the SLA. So let me put my Fortinet hat on for a moment. Fortinet has taken it a step further and gone with secure SD-WAN, uh, SD-Branch, and secure SD-Branch. So we'll talk about each of these individually. So basically your legacy WAN typically would have one link, MPLS, to another site, and then maybe that site has a backup link, uh, or it's a corporate, and then you go out through internet over that link as well. With SD-WAN, we're adding additional internet links, and then we're able to do um, we're able to do VPNs over these links. We're able to send traffic both across MPLS and the internet overlay across the internet links. Uh, so we're allowing uh, allowing us to leverage SD-WAN at our location. 
Now, Fortinet has taken it a step further, and because SD-WAN is built directly into the FortiGate, you also have the privilege and luxury of taking advantage of the security policies and UTM features directly in the FortiGate itself. Expand a little bit further, the FortiGate is also able to manage switches and access points. So again, software defined, you're configuring everything in the FortiGate, and so they're terminating that as SD branch. And then one step further, Fortinet has a security fabric uh, that allows them with APIs to communicate with endpoints and allows them to gather information and make changes directly on the FortiGate. Again, software defined, it's all configured and automation. Some of today's use cases. So a standard use case we see in uh, today, actually this is even dissolving more and more, but we see MPLS connecting our different branches together. Uh, and then we have a secondary link to the internet. And over the internet link, we're doing an overlay of a VPN. Uh, so we're able to securely send traffic both across the MPLS on the private network and over the VPN, uh, over the internet to and from the branches. Uh, this connection can also take us to our multi-cloud or private cloud uh, scenario. We've got VPN going to that as well. Uh, redundant uh, broadband internet uh, enterprise branch. So in this case, we have two internet connections. Um, on each internet connection, we have a VPN overlay as well. So we are we have a secure connection through each ISPs between our headquarters, our branch offices, and potentially our private cloud, allowing us to do SD-WAN across those. Again, measuring the uh, SLAs, the packet loss, the jitter, um, and uh, packet loss, jitter, and delay across those links to ensure that we're sending traffic across the uh, best link uh, or load sharing or load balancing across both links. <clears throat> With redundant connectivity uh, for a smaller branch, maybe a rural area, we might have an internet connection there. Internet connection may or may not be the best of quality, uh, but we also have mobile that's that, that's uh, maturing in the area, so we can extend a mobile uh, mobile endpoint out there directly connected to the SD WAN, allowing us to have multiple links at our branch office, uh, thereby again uh, taking advantage of SD WAN and the multiple links. Uh, a little more complicated design here. Uh, this is an MPLS and internet. This could easily be two internet connections as well. Uh, we have in this case showing AD VPN, which is auto discovery VPN. Auto discovery VPN allows uh, the, the WAN infrastructure to discover other branches without having a full mesh environment. So it's a hub and spoke. And when auto VPN determines that two branches need to talk to each other, it'll auto build the tunnel between those two branch offices uh, for that communication. With AD VPN, uh, BGP is leveraged uh, to do that learning and BGP is uh, then um, used within the SD-WAN. So SD-WAN is able to take BGP routing protocols and determine the uh, best path uh, and load balancing path for the SD-WAN connection. So a short demonstration, again, leveraging our diagram here. We have two internet connections. So first we want to measure each internet connection to determine uh, the delay, jitter, and packet loss on each one of these. So ISP1, ISP2. So in this case, we see from the SLA, our ISP1 uh, has the least amount of delay. So that's what we're factoring that on. So determining the best path, we send traffic across ISP1. Uh, if ISP1 the, becomes degraded, uh, then potentially the delay could uh, increase without actually the link going down. So our SLAs would, uh, would determine that by continuing to check. So that no longer becomes a favorable link. ISP2 now becomes the better link. Uh, for the traffic. And so we continue to send traffic out ISP2 until ISP1 becomes available again. Now in the event we have some traffic that is, it's okay to send traffic, for instance, personal traffic that's now in business, 
out ISV1 and we don't really don't care about the delay, it can just go ahead and send it out there. We can continue to send traffic out ISP1 as well. But in this case, um, most traffic would be moved over to ISP2 if the delay was too high based on our SLA. So SD-WAN in summary, a couple things to think about. Obviously our transport, what do we have uh, currently in our environment? Do we have switched ethernet, MPLS, broadband, uh, LG, uh, LTE or 5G? Um, are we doing an IPsec overlay? Are we doing a VLAN overlay? Lots of things to think about there um, and how we're leveraging SD-WAN. Obviously, you know, any, any location, um, even with a single link and two VPN connections uh, can leverage SD-WAN. So there's lots of different ways to configure SD-WAN and, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, be able to leverage uh, SD-WAN in your environment. Security is always a concern we want to think about. So uh, whether you're using a FortiGate or some other product, uh, let's make sure we keep security in the topic and, and ensure that we're leveraging, you know, proper uh, proper controls there. Again, uh, my name is Tom Harpin. I'm uh, very happy you will join me in this seminar today on SD-WAN, Software Defined Wider Networking, uh, and look forward to um, presenting to you again. Uh, we also have our YouTube. I uh, look forward to more seminars and webinars coming your way. Thank you. Thank you for joining IS Squared's web series. And for more videos, training, and informative information, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit our website at isquared.com or sale at isquared.com.